bringing the people behind our food to life. Now, GMOs, that's genetic modification of organisms used as a food system, there's no particular reason to reject it until you inspect it. And when you inspect what the GMOs are, you say, oh, you took a soybean and it's poisoned by this particular herbicide called Roundup. But if you take a gene from a bacterium in the soil and you put it into the soybean, that bacterium is not affected by Roundup, so and that gene is not poisoned by Roundup, and it, that's the gene in the pathway of making aromatic amino acids. So you stick that gene in there, and you do a few other things. You don't put just that gene, you put an end and a beginning and an end and a promoter, and you put a couple more genes, and you put antibiotic resistance, you can do cellular selection and tissue culture, and by the time you're done, you have modified that soybean so you can grow it in the field, spray the herbicide, and the plant doesn't die. No doubt, that's what happened. But if you now look at that piece of DNA that you inserted into the soybean, if you now look at the genome of the soybean, start with the one you began with. That's a set of genes in order, like the names in a phone book with the spelling exactly right for everybody's phone number, address, and, and their name. That's in the genes. And now you put in this resistance to Roundup. What happened? Where'd that set of genes go? It obviously wasn't there before, so obviously it's been put somewhere. First of all, show us what you got, where you put it. Now, the general industry that produces the GMOs is unwilling to give us a genomic analysis of their GMO crops compared to where they began with. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing. If, if you took a, a book, like, uh, let's say you took the Encyclopedia Botanica, and you started putting sentences in the encyclopedia all over the place, then every once in a while you're going to screw up the whole meaning of what it's all about. And in other places, it's not just the whole piece you put in, you flipped it over, you cut it in a quarter, and then you put it in. And where'd you put it in? Did you put it in a, in a single gene that has a protein coming out of it? Or did you put it in some of the regulation genes that determine the activity of the whole system? Those are the questions that if you give us a genomic analysis of the soybeans, of the canola, of the, of the uh, BT corn, of all the GMOs, show us where you started and show where it's up to. And you know, they did that in part before they realized that some people might want to be knowing this stuff with the papaya when they had a ring spot disease of papaya and they put a virus and used it to be able to stop the ring spot disease, which is really a sort of trivial modification for a marketing appearances. You found out that the way they did it by putting the, using the virus and putting a gene in it it rearranged it and it was all over the place in the genome. So they actually provided the information that says, these are not equivalent to what you started with. This is not conventional plant breeding. This is a new category of manipulation that in itself needs to be examined case by case, product by product, with real long-term data because you are feeding it to hundreds of millions of people on the world. So I think that what we're looking at is we should doubt most of the scientists seem to be captivated by their jobs or by politicians so they don't really use science as their ethics they use bribery and coercion and dishonesty and faux, faux data at the same false data at the same time so if Monsanto is so sure of its products show us the real data about how you know this stuff is good for us how come all sorts of reports about different creatures getting poisoned getting tumors getting immune to problems arise when they fed diets that are replete with GMOs. You, you know, I do, I do uh, lament, uh, as they say, killing the golden goose. A whole lot of us and a lot of humanity have wanted to improve the health system. When somebody gets a pernicious disease, you really want to have a way to, to save their life and have them live a long, productive, uh, happy existence. Right? When, when tragedy really hits you because of health, because of circumstances, because medicine's poor, because there are no medicines for what you got, people don't understand what it is that you'd like to have, how, could, how can you deal with the duality of this circumstance that here's a genetic engineering that, and it can be used in profound ways. I mean, 20, 19, well, 40, I was 47, I was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, uh, and so uh, by ten, I, I it went into remission by a macrobiotic diet for a bunch of years and uh, herbal prep, uh, hoxy prep, went into remission for another three and a half years. But at a certain point, maybe after eight, nine, ten years of having it, the nodes, the lymph nodes were growing, they were up into my neck. And when you talk about a pain in the neck, when you have a lymph node stuck right on a nerve ending, 
you are in, you, you're, it doesn't feel any good. And when the nodes start going down your chest and they block up your lungs, so you all of a sudden you get pleurisy and then it grows down into your groin and so you're in the process where you won't live very long. And uh, so uh, Dr. Robert Nagorny, who is a friend of mine, who's a molecular biologist, MD, a genius doc physician, uh, he took a piece of the tissue, put it, of the, one of the nodes, put it in tissue culture and figured out, we can feed you this poison and this poison and this uh, antibody, monoclonal antibody. And if we do that, uh, it'll probably set the cancer into remission. And he did it. And for 10 years, it was in remission. Uh, so Robert, that's called rational therapeutics. So Ro Dr. Robert Nagorny, an incredible when somebody who's a physician knows the molecular structure and physiology of the body in a way that he can figure out how things work. And he saved thousands of people's lives. He wrote a book, Outliving Cancer. It's worth looking at just because it tells you how you figure out to figure out to survive. So he treated me. I have a wonderful wife who cooked the right food. I mean, it helps to recover from the toxicity of the poisoning. But one of the things I learned was the monoclonal antibody was made in a fused cybrid between a human cell and a guinea pig cell, I think it is. And that made a, a antibodies that they could put in my body, which has kept the cancer in remission. So there's an example of genetic engineering used for the furtherance of human life. What I see is that the problem is that we're talking about the food system in general. So everybody is eating uh, GMO corns, GMO canola oil, GMO uh, soybeans, and they don't have good data that says it's healthy and, and reliable. Now, that's one way to look at it. The other thing is, we have lots of areas on the world that grow no food. The population's going up. We don't seem likely to want to stop growing our number of people, right? Everybody likes to make kids. We, a lot, not everybody, a lot of people make kids, to make lots of kids, right? How are we going to feed everybody a healthy, nutritious diet if we constantly are destroying the source of how we feed ourselves? The vitality of the earth, the cleanliness of the air, the abundance of, of sweet water to be able to fertilize, especially if you've got droughts. You've got all these issues about the allocation of resources all over the place, as you were talking about. Who gets to use the water in California? Is it the almond growers? Is it the cattle farmers? Is it the wheat growers? Uh, or is it the pot farmers? And so what used to be mountains that were covered with trees and there was a lot of water, why is there a drought? It doesn't take a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. The drought's coming from destroying our forests. The forests are mainly water. And when you take away the water, you don't have water to attract water to be able to pay. That's what happened in California. It's happening on the West Coast. It's happening all over the country. We're and we turn the, the cedars of Lebanon, the whole north of Africa, was a huge coniferous forest. We've been cutting it down. started thousands and 10,000 years ago. We brag about agriculture 10,000 years ago, and that, that's when we sort of started cutting down everything that led to fertility of the soils that gave us the agriculture to build up the populations. So we need to invest in organic agriculture, nutrition, and more ecosystems that grow food. Now, how are we going to do that? We could certainly try to figure out how to get a conifer tree like a spruce that grows up in northern Canada to produce an avocado. But it's more likely that we will do that by genetic engineering. And until we clean up the genetic engineering so it doesn't make fragments and make poisons and make immune responses in people, but actually feeds you good food, we haven't figured out how to use genetic engineering for the well-being of the food system of humanity. And that's where the contradiction lies, that the greed and wanting to put it out and own it and proprietize it is dominant to the fact that we want to feed healthy food to healthy people in a healthy world. And nothing is worth compromising all the ones you love and all the life you live because some bunch of people do not understand that it's not theirs. It's everybody's. The food system is everybody. There should be no patents, no ownership on anything in the food system. It's immoral. If anybody is a religious person, you think that a creator would make a world like this so we could poison it, so we could destroy the food system and all the people who have lived and all the billions of organisms have preceded us? We should take away all ownership rights on life. We should make sure it's good for everybody. That's all of our responsibility. I was trained as a research scientist. I'd rather work as a research scientist for humanity. That's why I have no problem with the GMO or any of these subjects, because you can scrutinize the stuff and you can figure out a path through the darkness. And on the other end, there's always light.